okay, so what you're seeing here is the Rover ERP desktop client. Um, it's got all of the modules available to us here. Uh, obviously, I have all security turned off because I want to be able to show you everything. But based on security, modules, procedures, and individual fields can either be uh, placed on a screen or removed from a screen for individual users. So by user ID, you can, uh, you can secure modules, you can secure procedures within a module and you can secure fields on a screen. So you can get right down to the field level with a point and click security system. Um, so just by way of overview, and again, I'll give you about a five minute overview. We've got a billing procedures, which is what we use because we use Rover ERP for our own in-house ERP system. So we put in a billing system with ticketing and, and call logging, uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, document control, an engineering module, which would be similar to your parts master screen and bills and materials and a product configurator. And then inventory is a separate module. So the inventory, the quantities, the locations, the bins are all stored in a separate area. There's an executive business, there's a field service if you send people out to do repairs, general ledger for financial, manufacturing planning, which is MRP, MPS, and CRP, capacity requirements planning, if you want to track any of those things. And again, all of these things are optional. You don't have to turn everything on day one. You can work your way into things if, you, if you're not comfortable with them. Um, sales and marketing with our largest module by volume, it's everything from uh, uh, the, the telemarketing to prospecting to quotes through uh, customers' orders and uh, sales analysis and returns are all part of the sales and marketing module. Uh, production, which is shop floor control, work orders, travelers, things like that, uh, project management, purchasing and receiving, which supplier performance and all of that. And then what we call, there's some uh, subsidiary modules down here. This workflow management is a nice, powerful tool. This is also called an alert system. So you can turn alerts on on any action in the system. And this is by user. You can have users do this or you can have an administrator do this. Uh, so they, you, you want to know when a part goes below minimum. You want to know when an order goes on hold. You want to know when a customer goes over their credit limit. Any of those things can trigger an alert as soon as the record is saved. And it can, that alert can be sent either internally through a message that would show you here under messages or it, and or it can send an email if you choose to be notified via email. So if you're on the road and you still want to know these things, it'll tell you. And then there's some other modules. And then within each module, like if I look at inventory, it's broken into three submenus: inventory entry, things you put into the system, reports and inquiries, and processes. And then if I look at the third level down, you get all the procedures sorted alphabetically by command name. So we're giving you not only a description of what that command does, but we're giving you the actual command name because it helps with comfort level and people just learning the system. Uh, additionally, you can see this inventory inquiry is also down here in my favorites. Each user can develop their own favorites down here, create their own little mini sub menu and go directly to that procedure, even if it's not open in a menu up here. And you can also type in inb.q up here if you know what it is. And, and these some of these procedures you're going to use every day. And after the first couple of days, you're just going to memorize IMB.Q. So we see people never using the menus. They just start plowing in the procedures they want to use up here. So again, our goal is to get you to the procedure you want to use uh, as fast as we can so you can be as efficient as possible. If I look at our part master, which is where you define parts. So from an engineering standpoint, you have parts and you have customers and suppliers and things, and you have part numbers. So you can uh, you can basically say what part do you want. If you know the part number, you can put it in. If you don't know, you can right click or double click and you can look it up by a partial part number, a model description, category, list of manufacturer parts or drawing numbers or configuration IDs or specifications, which are whatever specs mean to you. It could be a size, length, width, color, material type, thickness, heat, you know, whatever. UPC codes, if you're tracking those and customer part numbers. Or if you know that the part starts with a certain set of characters, you can just type that in. It'll go find all the parts that match that. And you say here, OK, so this is what I'm looking for here. Oop, I, got, I got the web up. Um, so part number, uh, these are all the, I, I'm not going to go through every field here because, again, it will take too long. But you have some basic information like you have an unlimited description. Uh, you're familiar with the PIC database. This is obviously the PIC database. We're running PIC behind this. So anytime you see a scroll bar off to the right, 
that's a pick multi-valued field. So this is an unlimited number of lines of description or characters, unlimited amount of notes, unlimited number of specifications, equivalent parts, drawing numbers. This is how we represent multi-valued fields on the screen. So that's how you that's how you'll know. Uh, and then there's you know categories and models, and all these are the things that are cross-referenced back to the part number. And there's material control tabs where you can have is this a lock controlled part? Is there a by unit of measure factor different than the stocking unit of measure or an issue unit of measure? Do I want to create work orders? Do I want to print labels? All of these are options on things that can happen with the part. And for use in the planning module, MRP, MPS, and capacity, it uses the, many of the options down here. Do I want to plan this using min max? Do I want to plan this using MRP or do I want to plan this using MPS? You can use more than one, but we warn you if you do, because sometimes they have two different planners and you got somebody looking at the MRP report, you got somebody else looking at the min-max report, they may be battling for the same part. Um, and lead times and order multiples and minimums. And again, I'll, I'll, we, can, we can cover all this stuff in a more detailed session, but then you've got customers and suppliers. So this is where we define a part. Now you notice there's nothing about inventory here, nothing about, except a, a default inventory location. There was an inventory location here. And this basically says this part normally lives in finished goods. It doesn't mean it can't live somewhere else. It just means normally it's in finished goods. So once I have a part defined and you define all parts here, you have assemblies, components, phantom assemblies, and line stock items, which are generally expense or floor items, depending on what you call them. So you just type it so everything that is a part number lives in the parts master file. From the parts master file, you have bills of material. And again, I'll just give you the 30 second drill here. And I see the bills of materials here uh, and I can pull this down, I can move this over. And because I'm using effectivity dates, you notice I have two item number ones. Uh, the first item number one was effective through 4.30.17, and the next item number one was effective for 5.1 after. So I've set this up to do a phase in and phase out as opposed to a replace. So when I run the bill of material report or use this bomb dated 4.30 or before, I'll see this part. Dated 5.1 or after, I'll see this part. But you never see both of them on the same listing, so don't worry about having duplicates here. And if you want to see multi-levels, you can pop a multi-level box. And you can see here, and you can drill down into all the parts that are below this. And you can keep going down as far as you want to go. This is just a, a grid that shows you what that what that bill of material looks like. There are reports. There are ex exploded reports, non-exploded reports, costed reports. But uh, the, the, the multi-level is a, a quick look at that. So I've got parts, and I've got bombs defined. And then I've got inventory. So I can look at inventory inquiry, and I can say, let me see that same part number. But by the way, everywhere the part number is prompted in the system, you have the same set of lookup options. So, so now I've got the inventory here. I've got parts, I've got a standard cost, an average cost, and I've got all of the active inventory locations for this assembly number. And again, scroll bar off to the right equals unlimited, so you can have an unlimited number of locations. And this would be a kind of a combination of your warehouse and inventory location. And then within the inventory location, I may or may not have bin numbers. So I can have bin numbers, which might be column, row, you know, can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, as defined, I think it's a 10 or 15 character number. I can't remember how wide. Uh, but there's also two types of bins. In this case, you notice I don't have a quantity associated with it. And that means this is only a reference bin. This part should go in this same bin every time. And the, it's an equivalent of the bin and the part number. But for purposes of picking, I want to tell them which bin to go to, but I don't want to just tell them what part number is. Uh, but if I can also turn on bin control, which means I would see not only the bin number, but I'd see exactly how many are on hand and how many are allocated out of that bin in every in every bin. And again, this is a sideways multi-value for this for this case. Excuse me. So I've got reference bins and bin control. Obviously, if you use bin control, you get a little more uh, a little more data entry because every time you put a part away or every time you pull a part out you got to tell it which bin you're working with and that is controlled by inventory location so what i if i want to right click here and open with inventory location entry where i defined this you can see i now have 
two screens open at one time. You can have up to 20 screens open on the bottom here, and you're still only one concurrent PIC user in the system. So you can have up to 20. We used to be nine, and then people ran out of ran out of screens, and we went to 20, and we not heard any complaints since. So uh, we figured after 20, you're hopelessly lost, so we'll stop you. Um, finished goods, in this case, there's a cost group, there's a type, there's an account number with it, a planning group, which could be a warehouse location or or a, a, uh, an area of the country. Uh, use in planning, in other words, when MRP looks at this location, does it does it count this as inventory or does it not count it as inventory? Finished goods, obviously, you count as inventory. Some kind of a MRB location, you might want to not want to count as valid inventory because you don't want the system thinking it's good. You haven't checked it yet. Things like that. So uh, this is where you define the location. And then by location, I, I see I have X number on hand. And by the way, because this part does not allow decimals, it turns off the decimals in the display. But you would see decimals if you if you were carrying decimals in inventory. So I got 65 on hand, 22 committed, eight allocated, 43 net available, and on order or incoming of 33. This could be work order or purchase order, depending on whether this is a make or a buy part. If I want to see the details of these, like commitments, I can go to the commitments tab and I can see which sales orders these are committed to. So I can see exactly which parts are going out, which customer they're going to, which location they're being pulled from. If I want to see that on order number, because this is a make part, I've got five open work orders. Sorry for some of the old dates here. My, uh, my production people must not be as good as yours are. Um, so I've got work orders. I've got the work order number. I've got the uh, the customer they're for and the location they're going to be completed in. If I want to see some usage history on this part, you can keep as many months and years of history as you'd like to keep. It'll should give you a graph. It'll let you look at 12 months or it'll let you look at 24 months or six months if you want to do that. And that's where that chart average of five came on the first screen. Uh, if you do do lot control, you can see all the individual lots for this part. This part doesn't happen to have lot control turned on, but you'd see any lots you have in inventory and which location they're in and the on hand allocated and available for each lot. And then inventory transactions, everything that moves inventory creates an inventory transaction from one location to another location. So from stock to finished goods, this IT.D is a manual inventory. This is a shipment. This is a work order completion. So somebody completed 10 out of WIP, somebody shipped one and finished, finished, finished goods to cost of goods, and somebody moved five manually. So you might look at that and go, who did that? Anytime you have a question, you can right click and view transaction details. And you can see the unit cost, you can see the procedure, you can see the ID of the person who did it, and you can see down here, any notes they put in when they when they made this transaction. And we keep before and after images of every location with the quantities and the cost. So if there was a, an adjustment that, that was made, you can see what the before and after picture looked like if you ever want to backtrack through things. And then there's images just in case you want to keep track of parts. Uh, we track, we keep the uh, path of the image somewhere on the network. So it's, we're not actually storing the image. So this is this is our inventory. So we go from a part number down to a location, down to individual bins, either reference or bin control. And so you can you can kind of see how that's laid out. Now, um, once things are in um, in inventory, obviously on the production side, when we look at uh, productions and work orders, we have routing. I have a routing which uh, let me look at this one here. We'll look at that same part. We'll keep picking on him, and we'll look at this in. Well, let's look at. Let me show you. I don't want to. I don't want to jump the gun here. So I look at the routing, and I can see a text representation of the routing because I asked for it in preview on screen. This gives me the routing and the individual steps. If I want to see an Excel version or a grid viewer, or I want to email this, or I want it to Excel or Word or even PDF. If I run it to PDF, it'll look like what it would look like were I to print it. And it goes off, it generates the PDF and it'll bring the PDF up then. And then I see a, a little 
nicer looking report that comes out in proportionally spaced fonts with graphic capability. Now you as a user can turn off these graphs and you can turn off the headers and you can turn off things when you want to export this, but uh, this is the way it looks like out of the box. So this is a standard routing. This isn't a specific to the work order routing yet. Oops, Acrobat is not responsive. Yeah, let's close that program. So that's a routing. Uh, and in a routing, if I look at what that routing uh, entry screen looks like, you can see I've got operation numbers, a work center ID, a description, which again is unlimited. You can see it's a little small, but if you wanted to make it bigger, you can view it in a dialog box, open the whole thing. Uh, you can have a start and end date for effectivities, uh, setup hours, and these are all in, in, uh, in, in hundreds of an hour. So setup hours, run hours per lot size, and then I can have pre and post operation hours, which also called move and queue time for a lot of people and then uh, operations and then crew sizes so this is the standard routing so when you talk about having standard times or uh, estimated times these are your standards so when you clock in and out of a job and you you post actual time it'll compare that actual to these standards and you'll get your efficiencies for labor uh, by work center and by by employee so if i look all the way down, if I jump the, the gun here to a whole work order, um, I'm going to look at, oh, I forgot what number it is. I think it's 973. So, okay, I've got a, I've got a work order here. I, this one is closed, but it's a part number. I made 10 of them. I used that routing. I had a release and complete date, and I can schedule either infinite capacity, finite capacity, or I can schedule manually. I can do things like I can create a picker, I can allocate material. Where am I going to build it? And where am I going to complete it when it's all done? And do I want to link this to a sales order, a purchase order, and or a work order? The routing and schedule gets loaded into here from that routing record. The hours on the on the uh, run times get extended by the, the quantity and, and factored by the uh, lot size. And then I can now tweak this routing specific to this job so if i didn't want to use this work center but i wanted to use another one i could i could select the work center from somewhere else and do any other work center i wanted to if i wanted to change the hours because i for whatever reason i know it's going to take longer or it shouldn't take as long i could tweak this specific to this job and then it shows me what materials were issued whether or not they were on the bill of material if they were on the bill of material it would show up under quantity required but what what shows up under quantity consumed is what was actually issued. So if I issued this at the beginning as a kit, then it probably shows what I issued. And whether it's the full quantity or partial quantity, it would show that. I can back flush this based on the quantity completed, if it's all or partial, and it'll consume only what was needed. And or I can make manual, adjust, manual issues to the job. I can replace this box. Maybe I didn't have any. I had to get 10 of a different box. I can use a different part number. And it'll show 10 with a zero here. And this box would show zero with a 10 here. So you see exactly what was used for this job. If I want to see what labor transaction, this somebody made a manual labor transaction here. And then I did back flush for the rest of this because this is a back flush job. Uh, but if I saw on this work order, this people clocking in and clocking out, whether they're doing the manual labor entry or whether they're doing a scan in, scan out, it'll still create a labor transaction with the number of hours here. And then costs show you, uh, I issued this much material, this much labor, outside processing, fixed overhead, variable overhead, material overhead, and what we call other costs for a total, how many were completed and how, much, how many dollars I've got left in WIP. Now I've got a closed work order with dollars left over in WIP. What that tells me is I completed the job before I finished issuing all the labor or the or the material. It does allow you to do that if you set the settings to allow you to do that. Uh, otherwise, it'll say you can't complete a job unless everything's done. Uh, but in this case, it's leaving a, it's leaving fourteen hundred and sixty dollars in WIP. And when I finalize this work order, it'll it'll take all the different variances 
that it needs to, and it'll calculate and write this $1,466 off to a variance. Now, you hope you never have that big of a variance working, but who knows in a demo account who did what here, so. Yeah. And then you've got shop transactions and part images and change history. So you can see who changed what, uh, uh, changed from S to C via ST.E3. Work order was pulled on that date. I can see changes in the picker record if there were any, and I can see attachments. So I have attachments scattered throughout the system in almost every record, attachments and change history. Attachments can be the attachment of any document, uh, a PDF document, a Word document, an Excel sheet, a drawing, uh, work instructions, anything you want that can show as an attachment. So whoever opens this work order can see those attachments and, and, and work off the instructions. So this is our work order entry screen. Now, if you look at give you two other quick things, work order R1, which is our traveler, and we'll run this to PDF of Aurora 973. So this Who's is what the, this is the work order document. So it basically says, here's the work order number. And here is a scan of that work order number. The okay. assembly number, the model number, the description, the quantity, any notes that they put in about it, when it's supposed to be released, when it's supposed to be required. So if you open up uh, a, 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 an operation move screen, you scan the work order, scan operation one, scan operation two, and it moves it. So you can do the whole thing with scanners. Or you can open it up and you can type in the work order number and you can type in it from operation one to operation two. So there's different different ways to handle it, depending on what you want to do. If, if you have a, let's just say a nice cheap USB connected barcode device, it's really easy to do that. Yep. You don't really need a an independent handheld device to be able to walk around the floor because generally when you do this, you're sitting in front of a PC anyway. What we call the traveler and then the other screen that the other Printout that you might want would be the picker record, which gives you the inventory listing that you need. And if I'll look at that same, and I'll go ahead and print the barcodes as well. And by the way, you can print a sequence which says print my bin location sequence, print by pick list sequence, or reference bin sequence, depending on how you want to see it. If you print in bin sequence, it prints it by bin number so that somebody can do a serpentine walk through the floor if they want to be able to find things. And then, so this would be the, uh, the the pick list. So this, if you are, especially if you are kidding the material up front, you would hand this pick list to an inventory control person. They'd go off the floor, they'd pick all the stuff, they'd either manually pull it, or they would, scan, again, scan the work order and scan the part to say I've pulled it, and then enter the quantity pulled. It'll show up here that they've already pulled it. And then um, you, you move on from there. And then, in a, in a, in a upfront kidding mechanism, then this piece of paper is done. You don't really need it anymore, but people will put it in the work order packet anyway to, for, for reference. Uh, but then the traveler would take over and follow the, the material through the floor. Now, I don't know if you kid up front, if you back flush, if you back flush by operation, or if you just do manually issues, but any one of those four options are available to you on the work order system. And that those those choices are work order by work order. So if I look back at, if I look, if I drill down to that work order number, this is where we made those decisions. Do I want to back flush the material or not? Do I want to back flush labor or not? And so if you, these are checked or not checked, you, you set a control record to default these, and then you can override them each job. This is the web version of the system. So we start off with dashboards and we deliver, this is, this is a sample of our Rover BI tool that we have incorporated into our front end on the website just so people can have some dashboards to come up and this is a standard you know order sales orders total orders sales order by uh, sales by salesperson there are drill down capabilities you can drill down you can view data so you can see where the data is all coming from and this is going right right out right off the uh, the main pick system so um, these are the modules that have been fully uh, converted to the web i've got a customer uh, database and I can look up customers up here or I can click on it and see this customer. You can see the same customer we had before. It's just a little bit different data because this is actually pointing at a development 
database as opposed to the demo we were endpoints to a demo database. But you can see customer name, phone, things like that, um, credit settings, pricing, shipping, sales rep information, and notes. And then across the top, I can see all my ship addresses, my contacts, my logs, uh, credit cards, deal sheets, change history, attachments, sales opportunities, quote, sales orders, RMAs, accounts receivable, and ticket in time. So if I look at, let's say, quotes, it shows me all the quotes for this customer and the, and the current status. So that is this, anything across the top here is for the customer I am under. If I want to see all sales activity, I can click on the sales tab and I can see sales opportunities, quotes, and orders. And if I look at these, I can see them in a list form or I can see them in a grid form, which columns them out, sets them up in columns for unassigned, uh, step, no contact, contact made, series, series. And these are user defined settings, by the way. So you set these up and then once you see this and you want to move this, you can drag and drop this over and move things around. So it's 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 a nice feature. And then when you what you see here, because I know this is where they're going. <laughs> if you think about that work order system, you'd be able to open up all work orders and you're going to be able to see the different steps where things are, what's completed, what's not completed, etc. Sorry, <clears throat> choking a little. Um, I've got invoices, which lets me, if I were to actually click it, shows me all the invoices for all customers. Outstanding, I can pay from here. Or if this is exposed as part of the customer portal, your customers could come in and click to pay and they can pay their own invoices. Obviously, they're only going to see their invoices, uh, but they can pay them online if you choose to allow that. Um, there is a scan functionality. And now this looks really big because I'm on a uh, big old um, big old screen. But if you're on a handheld or an iPhone or an iPad, you can see this sizes to the size screen you need. This would be the first one is inventory check, and it's it's like that inventory inquiry. It shows you the locations, the bin number if there are any, and how many are on hand. The picking process. Um, Oh, I don't know. I don't know the work order numbers in this system. Ah, good one. Um, transfer inventory, which is move apart from one location to another location. So you would move this from finished goods. I mean, normally I think Sean, scan, scanned and not entered. Sean, yeah. to your point too, right? Like the because the target device was the handheld here. These are all very simple interface. There's no real sex or sizzle on any of these. No charts or anything. It's all just a simple collection of form fields. So and that'll interact with the barcode scanner too, right? So runs, you know, jamming his way through on the ten key here. Um, yeah. But if that device had the scanner, right, then, you know, it's just users not, they're just popping from one thing. And then some of them will trigger the API call back to the system to go fetch additional information. Um, some of that stuff is fed from your system, like the location definitions too, right? So if we go down that integration path, one of the APIs you'd stand up is one to tell the front end, hey, here's our acceptable locations, right? Things like that. Parts checkout, physical count, physical recount start a job and end a job so if you have you scan your employee badge scan your your function and work order and you would just hit this and it starts the job it clocks you into the job it doesn't really have any effect other than starting a clock and then once you do that when you're all done you hit end job and you scan your employee number and your work order number and it ends the job and it goes back and sees when you started when you ended calculates the elapsed time backs out any breaks or lunch periods you predefined in a control record, and then charges that time to that work order. So this creates what we call a labor record, which would be okay. similar to sitting down and entering two and a half hours of time. I spent on this, but it's real time. 
Um, and then scan a shipment, pick a shipment, and pack a shipment. 